We have one scripture reading this morning. Daniel chapter 6, beginning at verse 1 through verse 28. Now it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and over those three governors of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. And then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. And so the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. And then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And so these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and the advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. And therefore King Darius signed the written decree. Now when Daniel knew that this writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room with his window open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. And then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and make supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Well, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or any man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? And the king answered and said, This thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. And so they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decrees that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. And then these men approached the king and said to the king, Well, know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. And so the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him, and his sleep went from him. And the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. And the king said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you have served continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. And now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. 
them and their children and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they even ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and he rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who? has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Here ends our reading. Well, as you well know, already today is the first Sunday in Advent. And this year, the Advent season tends to be one of the longer seasons of Advent that come around. Now, the modern Advent uh, comes, as you know, four seasons before Christmas Eve. And so in the year Advent 2020, there are four seasons and then still more days after Sunday before arriving on Christmas Day. Now you have sometimes where it's just the opposite phenomenon where you'll have the fourth Sunday of Advent being December 24th in the morning and then you have the service in the afternoon as well for Christmas Eve. So that makes for a busy day for some churches. And so it is that we count backwards this morning as the season of Advent is calculated, but of course it is a count much further in the distance in that we remember Jesus Christ's birth 2,000 years ago. Now, Advent is, yes, a time of looking backwards and thinking about Christ's birth, but as you know, the season is more complex than that, that it is also a time of looking forward, of when Christ will have a second Advent, when he shall come again as king and judge the nations. And so it has this feel to it, this, these emphases, that it's a look backwards, It's a look forward into the future when Christ shall come again. And it also is, of course, a time when we pray that Jesus would continue to come to our hearts through the preaching of his word. And so it is in this season that we sing hymns like this that reinforce this point. Like, O dearest Jesus, holy child, prepare a soft bed undefiled, a holy shrine within my heart that you and I need never part. That's Martin Luther's Christmas hymn. And also there's another one too, uh, O come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there is room in my heart for thee. So in this sermon this morning, we will be looking backwards, and we will be looking, but then looking at Daniel as well, looking forwards and seeing Christ, and how Christ comes to each one of us as we hear his word today, and how he comes to you not only with his love and his presence, but also his blessing and his salvation. Now before Daniel's time, you remember from uh, the scriptures that The southern kingdom, Judah, had been besieged. And the Babylonians, present-day Iraq, they came and took the people into captivity in the year 587 B.C. And the Babylonians took some of these people away, as we read in the Bible, and they brought them to their own courts. And here it is that our story comes today with Daniel and also some of Daniel's associates as well. If we were to read a little earlier in the book of Daniel, the beginning chapters, we read about the stories of his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now in the royal court, these men, whom I just mentioned, they had risen to prominence because when the Babylonian captors took people out of their homelands, they wanted the best. They were looking for people who would serve the interests of the empire. And so they took the people who were sharp, the people who had skills. And Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were those kind of men. And the scriptures tell us in Daniel chapter 1 that the government there had placed these men in authority so that the huge empire that the Babylonians had conquered for themselves, they appointed these men to reign over, or to oversee, to administer these places because it's very difficult to govern a vast territory, especially in those day and ages where you couldn't pick up the phone and call and ask what's going on. And so we read about uh, these men. And, of course, we remember the famous story in the book of Daniel earlier where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow down to the Babylonian gods and they are thrown into the fiery furnace and God protects them. We read another story in the book of Daniel 
where King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has this dream, and he's so frightened by this dream. And so he goes to all his wise men, all his seers, all those who look up in the skies and astrologers and all anybody who could uh, divinate for him, what does this dream mean? And, of course, he didn't get much of an answer from them because he was so concerned that they were just going to be yes men and tell them something that they wanted him to hear and not upset him that he said, I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You just have to know what the dream is and you tell me what it means. Well, that didn't uh, produce a lot of results. And Daniel and his associates, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, knew that they also were going to be tapped as resources because they were men of some learning and knowledge, too. And so they prayed to the Lord fervently, Oh, Lord, please reveal this dream to us. Not only give us its contents, but give us its, its interpretation as well. And so, of course, we read another great miracle of scriptures when the Lord provided for Daniel and his friends by giving them the interpretation. And so he told the king, and the king, of course, was quite impressed. And he was taken in by Daniel's God. And so that's the backdrop today as we uh, come to this next story in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, where Daniel was persecuted for his faith. And it wasn't even that the king wanted to persecute Daniel for his faith. You know, we think of plenty of times in the scriptures when God's people were arrested and harassed for wanting to be true faithful followers of God by the king because he was jealous of the attention that they were giving to their God instead of giving him honor to himself. But in this case, it wasn't the king. It was the king's advisors because they saw these other men who like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who had done well and Daniel who had received this vision and they were jealous of how well he was advancing in uh, the society and in, in the government's cabinet. And so they come up with this idea and we heard that in our scripture reading today from Daniel chapter 6. And they said, we've tried to follow Daniel. We've looked at everything about him and we can't find any faults with him at all. He's just a man who obeys every jot and tittle of the law. The only way we're going to be able to catch him is if we catch him in his faith. And so like any king then, the, the king falls to the trap of those who seek to conspire around him and they appeal to his ego. And of course we understand why that's uh, understandable because people are always pleasing the king and are yes men and yes women to the king. You know, these words that they say when they meet, greet the king, you know, oh king, live forever. You know, the same way we, you know, the British people would say, oh, you know, long live the queen or long live the king. They were people who tried to gain favor with the king and flatter him. And so they trick him into signing this law that says for only 30 days, you're only going to worship the king. And so he was foolish enough to do it. Now, there are a few peculiar places in this story, if you think about that. It's a story that's laid out in Scripture kind of strangely because it emphasizes some things over and over. I mean, I think it's three times in the text where it says the laws of the Persians and the Medes cannot be changed. And that makes one wonder, what was it in their rules that would actually do this? I mean, if you're supposed to be a king, right? If you're supposed to be a king, can't you just say, well, I'm changing the rules? I mean, because a king doesn't, in, in especially in the Old Testament times, they didn't rule by a constitution. They weren't a constitutional monarchy like Britain's queen, where they were very limited in their powers. The, the law was the king. But for some reason, in this case, they had done something, they had established it, that the king was not absolute in his authority. And so they tricked him and made him sign a law that he, he even himself couldn't reverse, which, you know, to me, sounds so strange. Why would you just not make the first ruling that I, re I reversed this ruling? It's just like Jesus, too. You remember in the scripture, they say, we're gonna try they tried to make Jesus king by force. How do you make somebody king by force? You can just say, okay, I'm no longer the king. But anyway, so that's one strange thing that we notice in this story, that, you know, why could the king not reverse his own decision? Was it that he really was, unable to reverse it, or was it in the sense that he was so embarrassed? We have to wonder if there was some pride there that was also playing into it. And maybe technically was the case that, you know, that, that there was some written document that said the king's laws could not be changed once he makes them. But we kind of wonder if it's more like John the Baptist. And we remember how John the Baptist lost his head because King Herod wanted his daughter-in-law to dance. 
she reads about this in the Gospels. And he was so interested in having her perform for his friends at his birthday party that he said, I'll give you anything, anything if you will dance for my friend. And she said, okay, the head of John the Baptist. Well, then he didn't want to do that because he liked John the Baptist. But it wasn't that he didn't have the authority to reverse his decision, but he was embarrassed. And so we wondered, number one, was there pride in King Darius? Now, secondly, another question that presents itself is why did Daniel endanger himself? Why did Daniel endanger himself? Well, of course we understand that Daniel was faithful. He was going to pray. He wasn't going to stop praying because some king who had been tricked uh, said you can no longer pray to your God. I mean, God had done great and miraculous things in Daniel's life before, revealing this vision. I mean, Daniel wasn't deterred by something like that. But it tells us specifically that Daniel went out into the open, that it, with the window open, he prayed to his God three times, and therefore he was caught. Why do you think Daniel wasn't more discreet when he prayed? Remember Jesus' words when he says, when you pray, go alone in your closet and pray. And Daniel could have certainly done that. He could have saved his life. He could have saved himself from a lot of heartache. And so we wonder about that too. Did Daniel know that he was, had been raised up for something more? That this was a way, just almost like Jesus himself, you know, when he knew that uh, he had a time to come when he would need to suffer for many. Uh, Daniel, too, must have w wondered if he realized that this was a moment that he had to show his witness, that he had to show the world that no human authority can ultimately control you. And then there's a third question that comes to our minds this morning as we think about this story, and it strikes us as a little strange, is that when King Darius saw that Daniel was delivered. And then he turned the tables around quickly and threw those men into the lion's den who had conspired against him. It wasn't only the men who had conspired against him, but what did our scriptures say? It was their families and it was their children who were thrown into the lion's den as well. And that makes us uncomfortable. It makes us feel bad and we have to realize from this that sin does indeed have consequences. And that's an important lesson to learn in life, that many times people think, I'm not hurting anybody but what I, by what I'm doing. My sin isn't harming anybody except myself. But that's not how it is with sin. When you disobey God, the ramifications are just like throwing a, a pebble in a water in, you in the in the the ripples go out. There's always more to it than we can see with our own eyes. And so we take up these questions this morning, not having perfect answers. Because if we had perfect answers, we wouldn't be raising these questions in the first place. But there are some things that we can take from God's word and apply them to our lives to see that God is still working even when we don't quite see how it all comes together. That God still has a righteousness and a holiness that he works in the world and in your life that you can't figure it out for yourself. Why, Lord, is this happening to me? Why am I having problems? Why am I being punished for all the bad things that other people have done in their lives that have, have negatively affected me? Why am I the one that suffers from my dad's alcohol problem? Why am I the one that suffers from my mom being verbally abusive? And so we think of these this situation, narratives come together to show us greater truth about how God works. So I mentioned this morning already that we were going to be looking backwards from Daniel today, and so we're going to do so also by going to the story of Joseph, Joseph in the Old Testament. And we remember that Joseph in the Old Testament was one who was also taken from his homeland, that he was sold by his brothers. They were jealous of how accomplished he was just like you know these men were jealous of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego so were Joseph's brothers jealous of the attention that his father gave to him and giving him the coat of many colors and all the tall tales that he tells but when he was sold into slavery he ended up in prison but in prison being at the lowest of society he had that same ability that God had given Daniel Joseph could interpret dreams. 
And so we see a number of these really interesting comparisons as we keep going back and forth between the two stories. That we see that in Genesis chapter 41, it says that Joseph's name was changed. And this isn't a name that we use for Joseph very much, but he is called Zephanath Paneah. And Daniel was also called by a different name, given a foreign name, Belteshazzar. Their dream interpretations and their serving in administrative functions and overseeing the entire kingdom was a part of their resumes, each one of them. That there was a very similar way that they were betrayed and you know, fell down into the lowest parts of society and then, of course, rose up to save the nation. There were men that each one of them, it tells us in the scriptures, both of them had a golden chain placed on their necks to show the authority that the, the kings had given them. But most importantly, they were both used by God to, to deliver their people. A fascinating as these similarities are as we look at the two lives, even, you know, with the stars. You know, as Joseph was the one who interpreted the stars, bent, uh, bowed down to him. You read about that. And then also in Daniel, he was the one who interpreted dreams, and he and his men knew people in the courts who were astrologers, like the Magi, whom we think are actually the Magi who might have come in successive generations to see Jesus. But anyway, the most important part of the whole thing is that we see that God uses these stories of trouble to make something much greater. This is the way God does things. This ca- then strengthens us. It gives us hope. It gives you hope for the future, knowing that when the bad things come in life, God can still work something good out of it, just like he's done for generation and generation and generation, not only for Daniel and his trouble, but even for Joseph and his trouble. As the book of Psalm chapter 90, verse 1 says, O Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. And so it is this morning, as we've been looking backwards, going from Daniel back to Joseph, we also can look forward this morning as we look to the one whom Daniel said would come and deliver us from our troubles. And that's why we sang that song that we sing many times during Advent. O come, O come, Emmanuel, ransom captive Israel. We're not only talking about Israel. You know that. You understand that the story is also about you and that the Lord would come and deliver you from your sins. And so we see that same hope. And just as we compare the lives of Daniel and Joseph, we also can find how God's faithfulness is seen when comparing the lives of Daniel and and Jesus. First of all, just as you look backwards to the life of Joseph, you look forward from the life of Daniel to the life of Jesus, and there's another Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. And Jesus was also taken to Egypt, just like Joseph, for a time before he was allowed to come back. And how did Joseph, Jesus' father, how did Joseph know why he should go to Egypt in the first place? The book of Matthew tells us that it was revealed to him in a dream, in a dream. By those wise men who came from the east, they also had been warned in a dream not to return the same way as Matthew chapter 2 tells us, but to go by another route. Both Daniel and Jesus, and Joseph for that matter, were men who were recognized for their wisdom even before they were men at their young age. We think of Jesus at the temple at 12 years old. And Daniel was a young man, too, not as young as Jesus was, but we're told that he was a young man in the book of Daniel and those who were jealous of his abilities. And like Jesus and like Joseph and like Daniel, all three in a row, they were men who could not be foiled except for when the situation was turned on them unfairly. We think of Joseph and Potiphar's wife who tried to seduce him. They couldn't do anything to Joseph by, he was too honest that he couldn't even, uh, he wouldn't even take advantage of a situation like that. They couldn't do anything to Daniel. The only thing they could do to him, as we said, was that they could convict him for praying. And the same with Jesus. They couldn't trap him on anything the Pharisees tried, the Sadducees tried. There was no guilt found in his mouth, as Isaiah tells us. Jesus, too, was arrested during prayer. Just as Daniel was arrested for praying because it was illegal, Jesus wasn't arrested because prayer was illegal. But when Jesus prayed, he was arrested because he prayed because he was God's son. And he was taken away because he claimed to be God's son. We think of further things that are just so interesting. We think of King Darius and Pontius Pilate's wife both being very disturbed about the man being arrested. Darius couldn't sleep that night. He couldn't eat. He fasted because he couldn't keep anything down. 
The same way as Pontius Pilate's wife, when Pontius Pilate sentenced Jesus, that she, the scriptures tell us as well that she also uh, was very disturbed by this in her sleep. When King Darius awoke the next morning, he went to the den. And when he arrived at the den, he probably was thinking Daniel was gone. I mean, how would you not think that? You're thrown to the, the mouths of hungry lions. So he was going to the tomb basically expecting death, and he found not death, but life. And who is that similar to? When the women who came to anoint Jesus' body, believing that he was dead, but instead finding an empty tomb and the angel saying, why do you look for the dead? among the living. Both King Darius and Pontius Pilate did not want to convict the accused of death. You remember Pontius Pilate too, and he said, you know, I wash my hands of this. This man is, I don't find any fault in him. And finally, Daniel had apocalyptic visions that pointed towards the coming of a Messiah. I think in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, this is just one chapter after our verse today or our scripture uh, lesson for today. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came like one a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So we see here even the same language. It's the same terminology. Daniel says, I see a son of man coming in the future. And what does Jesus describe himself as? The son of man. So we can see this great pattern all throughout the scriptures that God is faithful, that God is with you, that God is working in your life. And it might not be the deliverance that you're hoping. It's not, maybe isn't as, as easy of a cure or a deliverance as Daniel got. But God is still working. That God is still doing something great in you. And we even think of those, like, you know, in the book of Genesis, so it, what others intended for evil, God meant for good. And so we can remember that in your life, that even in times of adversity and in struggle, that God can do uh, something great. And so as we think on these things, and we, you know, we, we identify with the story, and even I was thinking this, this week as I was preparing, of course, that we look at this, the conspiracy around King Darius, and it kind of reminds us of some of the things that we've been feeling at times in our lives about, you know, who, who really is pulling the strings or who's really making the rules in our world? And sometimes it feels like there are people who are pretty directly ordering that there would be a time coming, you know, where w it would be illegal for us to come together and, and worship God and pray the way that we want to. And, you know, it sometimes it sort of feels like that. I mean, we've all felt that that uh, instinct in us a little bit that does this feel a little bit like part of the reaction of you know the virus is that you know it's a way to it's an opportunity to kind of put religion back in the corner a little bit and, you know you, we have to just wonder about the we don't know how these things work i mean no uh, just as you know dave was up here we're not saying in any way that there is not any danger in the virus that's very very obvious uh, none of us are trying to make that kind of claim this morning but there are always are these different forces working around. We have to remember that life is just so incredibly complex and that God is working in so many different ways. And if God can use something like this to bring many people to repentance, that, that he can still work his purposes there. And if God is showing people that we take our church for granted when we have had the luxury of being able to come every Sunday and then all of a sudden now we can't for a while and those kinds of things. It's teaching us what a privilege it is and what a blessing it is to have God giving us this opportunity to worship together. You know, we think of laws even about things like hate speech and, and you know, are people conspiring against us? Are people trying to pass rules against us? And yeah, those things uh, do seem to be always swirling in the background. But these things are not the ultimate authority. That King Darius himself, he was an earthly authority. He was the king of the Persian Empire. But yet he, for whatever reason why, he could not reverse his own rule. Jesus Christ can certainly reverse the rules of the world. When he placed his hands on some person and said, deaf ears open up, something that's against the rules of the world, scientifically, it happens. So do not fear anything in this world. Do not fear the disease. 
I mean, take precautions, of course. That's why we're practicing social distance. But all these things that are happening in the world, just like they happened to Joseph and like they happened to Daniel and like they happened to Jesus, these are not the things that ultimately should bring us fear. For what does Jesus tell us? Don't fear those who can harm the body, but fear the one who can destroy your soul in, in hell. So that's an important lesson for us to remember that while there are legitimate fears out there and there are concerns and there are many things to be nervous about in this day and age with your health and you know how you're going to do Christmas this year and how you're going to pay for the Christmas presents because you don't have as much money this year and you can't go out and buy the gifts and whatever. These are not the important questions of life. These are not the things that ultimately are the things that matter for eternity. The things that matter for eternity are not where are you going to spend Christmas at whose house and who are you going to be with, but where are you going to spend your eternity? As Pastor Dairud says so eloquently, what's your forwarding address going to be at the end of days? Is it going to be heaven or is it going to be hell? Those are the questions that we have to ask ourselves. Those are the kinds of things we ultimately worry about. The things of this world, not so important. As 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, this world is not our ultimate concern. John 15, 19, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world, and therefore the world hates you. It's just being a part of who it is as a people of God. Just as it was for, as it was for Joseph and the trouble he ran into and Daniel and Jesus. These are the things that we... Uh, find hope in not in any earthly power or theory or political philosophy. We rest and find our hope and security in Christ. As Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 tells us, our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. And so this morning I leave you with uh, one more verse today from Daniel chapter 12 that reminds us of uh, what's coming. What, uh, it just as he was, you know, looking forward dimly, seeing what was coming into the future, we hear these words. Daniel chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. And there will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. And multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to everlasting condemnation and contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So here again we see the stars, you know, just like Joseph with the stars, interpreting the dreams of the stars, and Daniel talking about the one who will come and the stars will fall. Jesus told us that as well. I guess I didn't quite tell the truth. There's one more scripture verse I have for you today. Matthew 24, 29. Jesus said, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. These are the times, those are the moments for which we think most seriously about.